Larry, when we super your name, we're going Indian Larry, and underneath that, what do you want me to put? Um, bike builder extraordinaire, president of Indian Larry, or what would be your president body? of the United States? President of the no, the universe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, geez, I don't know. Chief builder, uh, owner uh, proprietor. Um, we can talk geez. about it during the day. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's just, I don't even know anymore what the hell yeah. it is. You know, I don't even know. It's, I mean, I'm the guy that writes the checks, but I really, you see my business logo? <laughs> I don't know. I, that's, I was going to ask you about that, too. Um, so let's, let's start off, but just tell me a little bit of your background, Larry. Um, when did it all start? Well, I was born. <laughs> now let's see when it started. I, I I guess I became a motorcycle crazy probably when I was 12 years old. Although I, I didn't realize it was motorcycles, it was like bicycles. It was just two wheels. And then probably by the time I was 13 or 14, I was starting to realize like a motor could be attached somehow. I didn't have it quite figured out till I was probably about 15 that I was a actually able to combine. Uh, you know, some farm equipment and lawnmower stuff to a bicycle and actually make it go. Not that successfully, but it went. And then it was like a constant struggle from that point to evolve. And when I finally saw like a real motorcycle, you know, I think it was on TV, and then finally, you know, on the highway, it was like, that's it. So that's pretty much how it started. Um, did you grow up in the city? Did you grow up on the farm? No, up, upstate New York. Yeah, upstate New York. and. Uh, it wasn't too far from here, about 75 miles north, and uh, but back then it was pretty much farm country. It was uh, a lot of orchards and uh, you know apples and I think pears and different farm stuff and animals and things like that. It wasn't like it is now. Now it's just urban sprawl. So great upbringing, though. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. You know. Yeah. Um, Experience slices of life that other people don't get to experience really that much out in the country. Um, um, and where did you get the name Indian Larry? Um, that came from the Indian motorcycle. It was uh, I played around a lot with Indian motorcycles, and the name just stuck. I mean, you know, in the bike scene, you get a name, you know, Panhead Jack or Sports or somebody, or you get a nickname. Or, you know, of course, Tiny is like the biggest guy, you know. And so there's always some kind of nickname that befalls you. And I was pretty happy that, like, Indian Larry stuck because there was a whole string of other ones, but <laughs> that one stuck, and I was happy with that. I stuck with it, and it worked for me professionally. Most people think I'm an American Indian, but uh, in fact, it's just a nickname from the motorcycle. When you start signing the checks, you have to... Uh -huh. Dramatically shift the focus to, from Mr. Nice Guy to. Uh, we gotta get this shit done. <laughs> exactly. Um, so you started tinkering with bikes at an early age. Got into <clears> the first time you saw a motorcycle, you knew that was it. Tinkered around yeah. with a lot of Indians. Um, uh, so it, a year wise, 15 for you, but what year was it as far as that love of motorcycles when that started? Oh, it had to be what? early 60s maybe something like that just at the really the beginning of the chopper movement so you've been in it from really the beginning when from about the beginning there's some guys that are a little bit longer um i think they're still alive you know they've been around but really when i moved from like the bobber into the chopper phase that's really when i started getting into it and uh um speaking of that who who are your biker heroes, who, who stands out to you? That would be like Ed Roth, Ed Big Daddy Roth, or um, Von Dutch, only because, uh, you know, Ed Roth started the first Choppers magazine, but all his cars, and same with Von Dutch, they were outside of the box, they're thinking. They didn't have to be validated by what the current trend is, and that's what I see nowadays, too. Everybody, you look at Royal Custom Bikes, they're all identical, maybe different color paint, but everybody, oh, that's what they're building, so they have to build that. And with Roth and Dutch, they just did whatever the hell they want to do, which is exactly what I do. I mean, a lot of times, even from the crew sometimes, I, at least now they know that, uh, you know, just let them go because I got a proven track record. But early on, it was like, oh, don't do that. That's not, I go like, I don't give a damn. This is what I'm doing. This is what's in my head. That's what I'm building. And that's what Roth and Von Dutch did. They just they didn't give a damn. They just did what they wanted to do. So I admired that. I mean, it's kind of... 
takes a lot of guts, Larry. Um, yeah, it was a real pain over the years because it was, uh, you know, I had a lot of fights and a lot of time people didn't, I don't mean physical fights, but a lot of like arguments with the, my crew and stuff and they get, no, I don't do, you know, and, and then uh, even at the show sometimes people are like a little taken back until it sinks in and then of course it becomes the accepted and the copied. Yeah. And now it seemed to be at the pinnacle now because the whole chopper thing is like coming on strong and um, people are starting to get what I do now. They're getting away from the bastardized version of motorcycles. Um, it, uh, it's almost like a, a true artist, a sculpture or a painter or, you know, they come upon a new style. Well, yeah, like big heroes of mine other than in, in the scene itself would be like, you know, Michelangelo or um, Bruce Lee or guys like that or just it's... It's a whole mental thing. This is just the medium that, I, that I've chosen, you know. Since I can't really paint or I'm not like a sculptor, it happened to be motorcycles and metal, you know. I, sometimes I kid around and go like, like, I'm the Mozart of motorcycles, you know. It's like a child prodigy. That's just the thing. And uh, sometimes it can be torturous, you know, to... to <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you love and die by your art. And it is art. Yeah. I consider it an art. Yeah, I, I do too. I coined the term motorcycle artist years ago. As far as I know, I don't know anybody else that was using that because I, I couldn't really call myself a mechanic, although that was part of it. Um, but I go, like, what is it exactly that I'm doing? Because I was always trying to pigeonhole myself to qualify it. You were just asking me before what, you know, what I really do, you know. And um, I think now I'm just a mo motorcycle artist, motorcycle showman. Because um, it's not really like I don't really run a repair shop or a bike building shop and I really don't even care about a customer anymore. I build my bikes and, and if they sell, then they sell. That's fine. After they're built, just like a painting or a sculpture. After they sell, that's fine, you know, if, it, if someone wants it. But to, to build someone else's design for, you know, what they want, it's just, I can't do it anymore. I just don't have the interest. I'd rather get out of the business, you know, because it's not what I'm about. Not when I'm catering to some other people's needs is really not what I give a damn about. I've always been like a loner, and, and uh, I can't say any more about it. I don't care, you know, honestly. Yeah. You want to, you, that's your enjoyment. I mean, I will try to build the best quality product that I can, and if I sell one to a customer and I have a problem, of course I'll take care of it. But I mean, that's like, you know, my art, that's what I do, and I don't want to corrupt it or bastardized or. You know, right. uh, it's hard enough to do anyway without someone else telling you how you have to do it or what color to paint it or, oh, I don't like this, you know. Uh, in, as far as your heroes, uh, I got that, but and now would you say they also influence your style? Um, um, it, it, is there something that influences the way you build your body? Um, probably in the beginning. I mean, I, I patterned myself after what, like, Roth was doing. I go, like, oh, he's building you know, crazy uh, cars and bikes. And in the beginning, I was doing some hot rod work and car work, and, uh, but I got out of that because I really loved the bikes better. And then I said, oh, Roth was a sign painter and a pinstriper, so I went to school for that to learn how to pinstripe and, uh, and letter. And, you know, I learned how to paint. Every aspect of the job I've done over the years, except for the chroming. You know, I learned all my polishing, but I don't do the actual chroming. And um, Roth plated everything in sight. My early bikes were completely chrome. The whole motors, the frame, everything were, it was completely chrome. And um, he also had a t-shirt company who was selling shirts and things like that. So I said, I'll get a shirt company because obviously there's something there to it. And now it's very lucrative for us, the merchandising. So I was just kind of copying more or less what he did. So I was young and I didn't know. And now it's, uh, I try not to be influenced by anybody. I mean, I. I I look at the magazines and stuff just, and I watch the shows that are out just to see what's going on, but I don't like to let it corrupt me. I like to keep like my vision of what my idea is pure. And uh, the bikes that I build, I always tell people, yeah, they're a chopper, but I try to make them a cross between a top fuel bike and a road race bike, but qualified for the street. So it's really a, a detuned road racer or a fuel bike that I can ride on the street. I, I like extreme performance, very slim down. So I try not to be influenced by anybody because everybody always, you know, look at the trend now. Big wide tire. If you don't have it, it's not a chopper. Well, wait a minute. When we started, we didn't have big wide. It was all about slim. And now it's like, you know, they want a long raked out front end. Well, the bikes don't handle. It's not performance oriented to me. And then everybody like, you know, puts a bug in my ear. Well, if you want performance, you're building Jap bikes. No, that's not what I do. I'm a chopper builder. 
you know, I, but I, I don't like to build bastardized choppers. I like to build a performance chopper, how I feel like what we were trying to achieve in the beginning, you know, an improved motorcycle. And um, that's not the direction I see it going today. Okay. Um, where do you, um, I know where you get your influence, your background, who your viewers <clears throat> are. Where do you bring your current ideas from? I mean, does it pop to you when you're taking a shower in the morning? Do, you know, you wake up with an idea. Where do you, where do you pull your ideas from? Just Well, I'm basically obsessed 24-7 with ideas. Um, and like I said, I'm not trying to crack some revolutionary new terrain, so it's basically just a refinement of ideas. One bike evolves into the next one with subtle and slight improvements, because um, I really want a bike that runs perfectly and doesn't break. Because, um, you know, we run them as hard as you can, you know, wide open. And, and um, so I wouldn't say I'm getting any kind of revolutionary new ideas. I mean, I think that's the same thing Michelangelo was doing, just trying, when he painted the human form, he was just trying to get it like down pat, you know, trying to make an accurate rendition of what was in his mind. And that's all I'm really trying to do, capture the perfect motorcycle, which is never going to happen, but because the technology keeps going forward and, you know, I'm just pursuing that elusive um, idea of perfection and trying to enjoy the object as I proceed in that direction. So what's, what's new and exciting at Indian Larry's? Um, new and exciting. I'm pretty excited about everything that's going on. Uh, you know, the couple of projects I'm building, like I said, I'm phasing out the customers per se. I mean, all, pretty much right now, all the bikes I'm building are, are being sold um, without any customer input. They're just being bought, you know. So I just build what I want to build. And uh, I'm kind of like sad that they're being sold because it's, you know, I have to build more to keep backing them up. But um, it's okay. And I just, uh, we're trying to finish up one bike, uh, a 2004 Easy Rider Centerfold Tour bike. That's that Tiki bike out there that's on the lift. We're finishing that up. And then I'm getting ready to build a bike for, uh, well, of course, the Discovery Biker Build-Off. I'm doing a new one, I guess, to defend my current title, you know, 2003 Champion Chopper Build. I, I think that's what's going on. I'm not quite sure. But it's just giving me another chance to build uh, my newest, improved version. And as soon as I finish that, I'll probably be starting, um, uh, well, not probably, it's, it's a done deal. I'll be building a bike for SNS Cycle. They're releasing a new motor, uh, which I really can't go into in that. It's, uh, you know, uh, confidential until it comes out. But they'll be re releasing that for 2005, and I'm very excited about doing that bike. I have a few things. And uh, what else? We do have two customers' bikes to finish. and. Uh, I contracted them, and they're pretty nice projects. Um, but again, it's going back a couple of generations of bikes. I mean, I have to to build this one bike, and uh, I took the job. It, you know, you have to keep the finances rolling, and uh, I'm kind of sorry I took it now because the finances are rolling. But I have to make meet the commitment and do it. But after we finish those two, then we're just going to be doing continuing on with high profile bikes or personal projects. And that's where I'm going to try to keep our focus and not get distracted with customers. Because it's a nuisance. You have customers come in and it absorbs a tremendous amount of time that just leads nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, it's just like an artist. It, I mean, it, it, well, yeah, it, it absolutely a, is. I just, mean, a, just a different medium. Exactly. And I mean, I've always promoted the shop uh, over the years like a band. There's one front guy. You have a drummer. You have a guitar player. It's the same thing here. We have machinists, fabricators, painters. That's like the band. And I'm like just the front guy because... You know, I try to find people that are better than me in all aspects. And uh, right now, I'm just really trying to focus on the frames, the motors, and the overall design because I, I haven't found anybody better at that yet. Um, generally, when I get a motor from someone else, I end up blowing it up. And then I find a stupid little problem inside of it that's like, well, what are they doing, you know? So I like to build my own motors, and um, generally, they don't blow up. And I haven't lost a motor in you know, quite a few years, so. Um, Larry, it's probably hard to say, but where do you see yourself down the road? What, what, what do you want to be doing maybe five, ten years from now? What? Um, you know, that's funny because that's just exactly what I was thinking on, on the way uh, to, to the shop this morning. Uh, what do I want to be doing? What's important to me? And, uh, you know, that's when I did Motorcycle Mania with Jesse. Um, he was asking himself the same thing. He wanted to get away and see what's important. and. Uh, you know, 
hopefully I'll still be building bikes and riding in five years. Um, getting a little older, getting a little tired, you know, a little harder to get out of bed from a lot of bike related injuries and stunt work injuries and stuff and just getting beaten up, you know, life in general. But, um, you know, if anything, maybe even downsize the shop further that uh, I can just focus on what I want to do, what I want to build and what I want to do. And, uh, you know, at, at the same time, it's kind of ironic because I want to downsize but increase the income. Yeah. Um, so, but really what I try to do, and that's what the question mark is, I just try to get through the day, try to achieve what has to get done in the day. And there's not enough time in the day to get done what I need to get done. And then I move to the next day, that week. And in fact, I don't, I usually take it in blocks of weeks or two weeks. I have uh, a girl that manages me and books me out and I don't really know where I'm going two weeks from now. So I just, uh, she lets me know, okay, we're going where? All right, I think uh, we go next week to North, uh, no, tomorrow to North Carolina, I think. And then I go uh, to Hawaii and then I go to Seattle and then I'm filming for Discovery. So it's pretty much, you know, I got all I can do to focus on the now really. And you know, five years, I don't know. I really don't know. You know, just uh, I'm, I'm more like Zen, just like here and now, like try to get in as much enjoyment as I can out of the moment. You know, I'm really big on trying to stay in the moment, but there's a million things pulling out of that moment. Things from the past, uh, you know, mistakes in business or projections into the future. And if, if anything, in five years, I'd like to be more concentrated in the moment. Good, 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 good. Take a moment, but what makes your bikes unique? What, what do you, th if you can, is there a single word? Is there a single phrase? Um, what makes your bike stand out? Well, I'm not exactly sure if there's a single thing, but if it's any of the builders in this industry, in the, in the certainly the chopper, the custom bike scene, if they look at a bike like over there, they can tell immediately who built it, that I built it. I mean, there's a few builders that I can look at and I go like, I know who built that. But for the most part, it's all generic now. And I go like, I don't know who the hell built that. It could have been anybody. It could have been any number of 100 guys. There's a few guys in the industry right now, you can tell that they built it. And it's just the only thing with, with my bikes, I try to make them as perfect as I can. Uh, there's absolutely no Harley parts in my bikes anymore. They're just not strong enough. And um, uh, I just try to make them as perfect as I can. And constantly trying to improve and make them stronger, run better, last longer more reliable, faster, handle better, and yet be you know detailed enough to be crazy. I want it to be like one of those hunting watches when you look in the back, it's just like, oh my God, like look inside of there. That's what I'm after, just like extreme attention to detail. That's a good analogy, because those are fascinating pieces of artwork. The old yeah, I want it to be like if someone opened up like the door to the universe and it was all mechanical, you know, like a mechanical universe, not like an electronic universe, it was like, the mechanics of it, you know, like gears whirling and cams and escapement movements and things like that. We just open it up and go like, oh, I better close that, you know, that kind of deal. Um, you're pretty much a self-made man. You, you know, I, I don't know. I really don't know. I've had a lot of help from like my crews and stuff, but I would say so, but I, I, I can't really even take too much credit for that. I mean, I just... You know, I just sort of show up and try to live out my destiny, what's ever put in front of me. And I mean, can you take credit for that? I don't really know. I mean, it's... But you're self-taught. Oh, I'm you? definitely self-taught. Yeah, I'm definitely self-taught. I've had little tips here and there, but nobody's actually laid out the plan for me. And I mean, I've had to learn how to be a metal fabricator, a welder, a machinist, a mechanic. Um, like I said, over the years, I was a painter. I made my own seats really before I hooked up with Paul. Um, every aspect of this business and not only that i had to learn how to build a shop do electrical work and the plumbing and and all that type of stuff that goes along with the shop and and now my learning curve is like this because it's not only that now it's the business end of it and that's what sucks i mean that's like totally sucks every bit of life and creativity out of you the paper shuffling end of it which i know makes things happen but i have two managers now one for on the road one for the shop to sort of handle it and take some of that pressure off me. Because it's just ridiculous. And the amount of money that goes out for what I call the non-work. I mean, the real work happens in here. You know, out there when you go to the desk and the paperwork, that's just some kind of cyberspace world that, 
It's not like, you know, I'm the more caveman approach. Take a hammer and start hammering something. You can see it take life and form. And this other paperwork stuff is just some abstract thing. And unfortunately, it's a necessary evil. Yeah. Um, with so many bike shops creeping up out there, and, and maybe bike shops is not the word, but um, definitely bike builders. With so many of them popping up, you know, um, how do you stand out, or do you even worry about that? Absolutely no worry, because uh, really at this stage of the game, at the risk of sounding arrogant, I have no competition, because I'm not competing with anybody. I don't care what these shows, whether I win, lose, draw, just doesn't matter. I'm gonna do what I wanna do, how I wanna do it, and when I wanna do it, and that's that. But years ago, I welcomed the competition because the more shops that opened, the more work I was gonna get, because the more things that would need to be fixed, because the more places that were screwing up stuff. So I really, I never worried about that. I always welcome more competition. Okay. Besides that, there's enough for everybody. Even if you had 100 guys that were extremely good, there's so much work out there. There's people that like, that bad mouth and talk crap about other shops. Well, they're just trying to defend their lack of ability, really, you know, so it's, I don't go there. Okay, um, when we're talking art and artist, um, um, oh. <laughs> Um, when we're talking art and artists, I immediately think of, and I don't know if you've ever done it, but um, I think of, a, of, a, of an exhibition. I mean, you, you should have a gallery and do, and put your bikes up on pedestals and like have an open house. I mean, like an art show. I mean, well, yeah, I, I've talked about that in the past over the years. We're going to do a, a gallery exhibit like in, in New York on Madison Avenue and so or something with the bikes there, but not only the bikes. The stuff that goes into making the bikes, like layout, like the micrometers and all the, because people don't realize the precision that goes into these things. We, you know, there's art and you can be abstract to a degree, but there's extreme criteria. You know, the engines have to be built to about two ten thousandths of an inch, and a layman doesn't realize that. And you know, the um, that yes, end of it that happens to you serendipitously opens up a whole different arena. That I mean, when I let myself go in that direction, I go like, geez, I was trying to get there. But look, I'm over here now, and this is much better than being there. So it's like, I, I, I don't want to jinx myself or sell myself short. So I kind of just, you know, uh, you know, they Keep say trudge a road to happy destiny, you know, just try to not to map it out too much and just... Uh, live life each day. Uh, Pretty much. That's a hard enough job. Yeah, that is. <laughs> um, Art show, gallery exhibit, I can see these things in there, but it would more be more than just bikes. Well, it is, yeah, I was looking to do that for a while, and then it, it got to be a big job just trying to put the show together, and I was involved with a lot of other stuff, so I couldn't really do it. But last year, was it last year? Yeah, last year I was in the Journey Museum in Sturgis. Uh, it was a Michael Lichter uh, exhibit out there, and it was uh, called Kickstart, and I had one of my bikes out there in that show, and we had about... Uh, there was probably 15 or 18 bikes in the show, right in the gallery. Um, this year coming up in, uh, in Georgia, there's another museum show coming up that I'm gonna have a bike in down there. And then in D Daytona this year, the museum, I think it was Art and Industry, had a whole bike show that had probably 50 bikes in it. So, uh, the, and then of course the Guggenheim Museum, when they had uh, the Art of the Motorcycle, it was their most popular show ever, out of everything. So that just tells me that something's going on. People were very curious. I mean, when you had, I was there on the opening night, and it was uh, very curious to me, because you know, I'm into the arts and stuff, but then it was like outlaw bike guys, you know, club members, as well as like art people and socialites were all mixing together. And I go, this is a very interesting mix. You know, that normally it's like oil and water. People normally wouldn't mix, and um, the people were very curious, and it was a crossover asking each other questions. and. Very interesting to me. So it says something's going on with yeah. motorcycles being taken seriously for whatever reason. I mean, me, I'm, I'm spoiled, you know, that, you know, I've always loved bikes, so of course, you know, like, it's a case of that if you have to explain, like, you're not going to understand thing. But yeah. as far as museums and a gallery, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, yeah. And you said you were getting onto the train of thought there that if you did an Indian Larry show, which I think would be, you know, invite, get guys to bring their bikes, bikes back that you sold, 
put new bikes in there for sale, but it would be more than just bikes. You wanted to put other things in that show. Oh yeah, I wanted to put things like, uh, I, I figured we'd have like a case, you know, a flat case like you see regular museum, like at the Smithsonian or something. And you would have a lot of the tools that we use, like micrometers and dial indicators to show like how accurate some of the stuff has to be. And some of the process, like the gold leafing that we use, you know, the leafing is like 50 millionths of an inch thick. You know, you can't even touch it with your fingers. And it's, um, there's, there's a lot of finesse that goes on with this stuff. It's not just, I was referring before to the caveman approaches, hammering on stuff. Well, there's a lot of times it's just like extreme finesse. And you know, and this is in art too. I mean, I can feel, and guys think I'm kidding, but I can feel about five thousandths of an inch. I can differentiate up to about five thousandths of an inch just by feeling something like that. And um, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot to this. It's, it's like any art form. You can't just, uh, any art form you take, it's like a watchmaker, you know, it's, they don't get their due. Not, a lot of people don't. I mean, in, in the, the trades and in business, and it's, it's mind-blowing when you really analyze some of this stuff. It's, yeah, it, it's, it's more than just jumping in there and slapping paint and doing a few words. Yeah, it's not like, you know, when the whole outlaw thing and all the grade B Hollywood movies, you just think, bikers, you're riding and raping, you know. Yeah. Well... Fortunately or unfortunately, that's not what it's about. You know, there's a lot of hard work that goes into this. You know, and maybe, you know, five gallons you got to pour in to get one drop out. You know, that's a lot what I always say, too. Um, talk about your style a little bit. Um, how has it evolved over the years? I mean, if you could sum it up in a, a, a sound bite, how would you say your style has evolved? evolved? Um, well, years ago when I started, I was influenced by, you know, the long bikes, the choppers, and I've tried that style, and I said, like, this sucks. You know, I didn't like riding the bikes, plain and simple. So I, I tried to bring it into something that I liked, and I found with the shorter front end, a little bit less rake, a little bit more ground clearance under the chop. Not these bikes you see, like, an inch off the ground, because you can't corner with them, you know. It's, so I raised the bikes up a little bit. I, I you know, increased the clearance under there and the shorter front ends, and... But now they're pretty much, I mean, I, you know, I could be guilty of the same thing. People go, oh, like, you know, Indian Larry's bikes, they all look the same except for different paint. Well, because, you know, when you refine something down far enough, it gets down to that base. You know, when you purify gold enough, you're just going to have gold in the end. You know, you're going to have all the impurities out of it. And that's what I'm after. I'm after, like, the pure bike, the perfect bike. So that's, I think, how it's, it's like a distillation process. Do you see yourself maybe going through uh, a, a creative phase at some point? I, 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 a lot of times over the years I was influenced a lot by uh, um, sort of serendipitous actions, you know, stuff was, I go like, hey, look at this, you know, maybe, uh, you know, but I have a concept where I'm trying to go and I don't like bastardize that concept, but if something will fit into that plan, I'll let it evolve. And, a lot of times I was just doing a lot of flame jobs on the bikes and now I'm kind of into like the last bike I did, um, well a couple of the bikes now I'm doing some kind of graphics on them like I did that bike, uh, the Tribute to Ed Roth, the Ratfink bikes, I put the Ratfink on it and I did this bike with the Tiki on the tank with a hammer and a wrench so I'm kind of doing like a little cartoonish uh, motif that if it fits, you know, I'm not really like a theme bike builder, it's just Sort of, you know, that's just like the, the, the gilding on the lily is, a, is the paint. I mean, it's still, the essence of the bike has to do what I want it to do. So, you know, I, you do sort of have uh, some criteria. You're, you're handcuffed to a certain degree to the laws of physics. You know, and I'm not going to throw out the laws of physics just to, to, to go on this, some madcap art bent, you know, where it's going to distort my vision. Um, you know, I can sort of go artistically with some of the metal work and the, the paint maybe and um, but you know I, I work with that criteria so I don't, I don't think you're gonna see the bikes too far out of that realm I mean I, I think art wise if I can get a more highly detailed you know go into more engraving now and stuff like that um, I think that's more of I'm not opposed to experimenting um, but only if it's gonna make uh, the overall object better or more detailed or um, I still look for that over-the-top image when you know, I just like when people look at it at first I like them to be mind blown but within the framework that I want to create not to distort it out of that framework. Does that um, make sense? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and 
I mean, we're not going to see a drastic new Indian learned bike. I mean, we just won't see that. Not necessarily, you don't think, but... No, um, I mean... Uh, it will take shape within itself. There will be, you know... Yeah, I mean, it'll still be, like, if a builder looks at it, um, you know, somebody in the industry, they'll still know that it was built by me. I, I mean, I've been threatening over the years to do a couple of different departures, you know, like car engine bikes or, you know, maybe a jet engine bike or things like that, but... I'm not that interested that I think that's going to happen. You know, it's kind of a like an exuberant madcap flight of fancy that, uh, you know, I'm not that interested. I'm more interested in the V-twin concept, the slim chopper, you know, the pure object. Art plus performance. Yeah. It goes, in my realm, it goes hand in hand. And I mean, I see in the world in general, I see too much crap. I'm constantly trying to eliminate things from my life and refine things down to just really the, the perfect state where, if, where if, it's, if it's not quality, I don't want it in my life. I mean, and that's the same with relationships with people too. If it's you know, not quality, I don't want it in my life. It's a distraction, it's needless, you know. Uh, success, there's no argument. You have had success. Um, yeah, where was this? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody pinch me, tell me what hasn't happened. You know, it's, it's, I think success just means you have bigger bills and more responsibilities. I mean, it's success, you know. I, I have to laugh because I, I don't know what that means, you know. I, I, what, what do you think has got you, let's not call it success, let's call it at, you know, the point where you are in your career. What got you there? Um, I think the, 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 the biggest single thing, other than just not caring what people tell me, you know, just doing, being single pointed like to, to, to the point of a bull in a china shop, just going through to get to that thing. I think one of the single biggest things I did was just trying to treat people the way I want to be treated, just try to treat them respectfully. and. Uh, you know, in this business, is a real pain in the ass. I mean, it, it, especially with customers, because you can't make somebody happy no matter how good of a job you do. They're going to complain about something. That's why I'm not, you know, a bike shop per se anymore. Um, just treating people decently and, and just tr not losing sight of my vision. And That's good. That's a good answer. Uh, um, and we've kind of talked about this. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm like save that question until later. I'm talking about focus and, and that'd be a good question maybe if you want to float around a little bit. Yeah. Um, we talked about what's in the near future. Um, I'm going to ask you, uh, um, bike, the biker industry, the bike building industry, um, and I'm sure you've got an opinion, where do you see it heading in the next few years? Um, same place I've always seen, seen it heading, up Everybody told me from the time I was in this business that it's, uh, it's from the time it really started getting popular, the chopper period, and of course we progressed from that into like the custom bike period and, and whatever. Uh, there's a, oh, it's a fad, it's just gonna go down. But you know, statistics don't bear that out. Every year it's been, I haven't seen it like take a nosedive yet. You know, so since I was like in the, officially in the business at probably 18 years old maybe or something like that, I've seen it grow each year, and of course you always had the profits to do them. Oh, it's washed up, the yuppies are going to go on to jet skis, or whatever their negativity is on it. Um, I don't see that happening, I just see it going up and up. And I mean, I, I, you know, you would think with all these TV shows coming out, and all the new magazines, motorcycling magazines and chopper magazines, that the market would be saturated, but people that are obsessed with their, you know, with their stuff are obsessed with it. I mean. I'm not going out of this industry. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not going to go out of bikes, and the people that are into it are not going to go out of bikes, and it's just plain fun, uh, regardless. Even though there's, you know, bikes are dangerous objects. I mean, you got to treat them with respect, and stuff can happen. But it's big fun, so I don't see it drop. I see the industry continuing to climb. Um, I hope I'm right. Answer. I hope I'm yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's. Um, what does the question mark mean? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> uh, that's, you know, over the years it just sort of evolved. You know, I used the question mark for about at least 10 years. I started using the question mark. And then one day 
Paul like suggested he put the you know the uh, Iron Cross under it as the dot, and then Bobby was going like make it spiral because you you know you never know it's just all nebulous going on. And it's to me it's just a mystery of life. You just never know. I mean, you, I don't know day to day. I honestly don't know how this day is going to play out. I know what I'd like to achieve in this day. Chances are it's not going to happen. You know, so I'll settle for as much as I can get done. And uh, again, it's just like the Zen of the moment. Just let it play out, and that's how I run my business. And you know, you would think being successful businessman you have to have some answers I gotta come up with answers all the time I go like I, I don't know you know so what do you want me to tell you just it'll it'll work its own self out so yeah, thank yeah. God I got some managers and stuff yes yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but that's the it, artist yeah well I guess that's it you know so um, what gets your juice going what turns you on Larry um, is that the obvious um, you know uh, bending metal you know smelling you know after you, the well the the burnt metal smell i mean is that part of what you enjoy of the bike building um i certainly like metal when it's red hot you know when it's when it's red hot and we're forging or forming it into something i like that because uh, i'm i'm more of a blacksmith and like jesse's a sheet metal guy sheet metal former um you know i can do all the sheet metal make what i want but over the years sheet metal was just a necessary evil to the bike you know make a tank and modify it, make a fender or modify it but i was all about the engine you know it was all about the engine and getting the chassis the geometry down and uh i'm still excited i mean each engine i build you know i tell these guys here like when i'm finished building it's sitting on the bench i go like i hope it runs you know because until I actually hear it fire, it's like, you know, that, that's still very exciting. When I first hear the engine first fire and it runs and we, you know, I tune the carb to bring the idle down and get it, that's still very exciting. And then, uh, of course, when I go out and run the bikes, when they're broken in, I can run the bikes wide open. We get out west or something where I can just pin it where it's, you know, ready to explode. That really gets me excited. Is Brooklyn, um, uh, New York, um that I call it the ash can kind of look. Um, is Brooklyn, is that part of Indian Larry? I mean, w could, could Indian Larry shop be anywhere else in the United States? Um, you know, I, I think at this point I could do what I do like anywhere really. I got enough of a name, I can go anywhere. And I'm not really customer oriented or based, um, but I do like the section we're at here. It's an industrial section and we can really do it. I need to be where I can do whatever I want to do, you know, make noise and go out in the street and do a burnout or a wheelie or something. And just we had a party up here June 3rd and we had a jet dragster out here and we melted the street out. The cops in the fire department came and they just go like, oh, it's you guys, you know. And I need something like that because when I was in the city, you know, oh, look, there's a quarter size splotch of oil on the sidewalk and people are ragging at you, you know. Um, you know, I, I just, I want my freedom, you know. Okay. Um. Tell us about, um, and it, it looks like with, you know, Chopper's Ink trailer out there mm -hmm. and a couple of Billy's bikes in there. Right. And I walked through there and didn't even recognize them. Patrick picked them out right away. Um, um, tell us about your friendship with Billy Lane, how that has developed. Uh, well, we were just up in Laconia together. We set up side by side as we do any of the shows that we're both out together, uh, we're both at together, we'll set up side by side because, uh, you know, we play off each other, me and Billy play off each other, and instead of getting one and one, we end up with three, you know, and it's, uh, you know, I'll sign his shirts, he'll sign mine, we're friends, as I'm friends with most guys in the industry, you know, Kendall Johnson and uh, Dave Parowitz, and we're pretty much all friendly on the circuit together, and, um, you know, Billy needs anything, we'll help him out, and all the guys that I'm friendly with are welcome to use my shop, put their bikes here, and, you know, they pretty much roll out the red carpet for me, and, we're really all about working together. Did the friendship with Billy come before the biker build off or did it happen to cause um, We were a little friendly before that, I believe, but um, yeah, I mean, we were on the circuit and uh, cause I only known Billy a couple of years, like maybe, you know, personally known a couple of years, three, maybe four. And, but certainly after the biker build off, I mean, I seen what he was about, he seen what I was about, and, and um, we're just like chopper guys, you know, like to build bikes, have fun, you know, go wild. It, it, I'm, I'm very impressed with the biker industry, truly am. Uh, things are done with handshakes. 
you know, and it's still... Well, we, we try to do it on handshakes. I certainly, if I tell someone that's what I'm going to do, I'll die trying to do that, you know. But there's so many sleaze bags because there's so many contracts involved anymore and so many, especially dealing, I don't want to badmouth promoters, but I mean, that's something you have to be wary about and people just not doing what they say they're going to do. And uh, that really gets to me in a thing. I mean, I could, like with Billy, I know if we do a handshake, he's going to do it, I'm going to do it. You don't need this. And this is how it was years ago if a guy did it. And if you didn't do it, you get a black eye or a tooth knocked out. And it was, you know, now everybody's so happy and crazy. It's, you know, I, I, I call it the wimp wimpization of America. I mean, everybody's, get a lawyer. Or they get a, it's just, it pisses me off. I mean, it's not really how I think the country was supposed to be. I kind of like the Wild West approach, you know. Yeah, you don't yeah. do what you say you're going to do, I'm going to shoot you, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you can't do that no more, so. It's, Hence uh, the lawyers and, you know, the astronomical expense we have to incur to go over contracts and that kind of stuff. You might be able to shoot more arc around this way, but just, you know, just try a few things. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to talk to him for a few minutes. Can I move the light? Yeah, yeah. It's what I call a real art. Him and my painter. Yeah. And I'm always saying to them guys, you know, they... They tell me I'm a jerk, but I always tell them that like one day I want to have some talent like like that, and they're like, "You're a jerk," but you know they they're what I am. I'm good, you know, but that's rare, you know. And when I see those guys, every time they hit the mark, every time go, that's art. Yeah. So we're all our own worst critics. Uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and this kind of like rehashing. Are you wrong? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and I like to keep some of the frame in there at times and oh, stuff. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what, what would you say your focus is, Larry? After you know, on your drive to work this morning, you were thinking about it, and what, what do you think your focus is now on bikes? Um, how do you mean? Uh, uh, I mean, um, what do you want your bikes to be? Um, and we kind of this is rehashing something. But perfect. <laughs> I want them perfect. I want them to start, run, not leak oil. Uh, be extremely fast, really quick, handle good, be comfortable to ride a bike you can sit on and go like, you know what, I'm going for an eight-hour ride and get off the bike and not feel bad. Um, and that's something be different. works of art. Yeah, I mean, that's something different. Most of these guys are after, not all of them, a lot of them are after the looks, you know, and, and it's refreshing to hear. Well, ironically, with a chopper, it's supposed to be all about looks, but it is secondary to me. And... Uh, even though I build choppers and rigid frames and you know that kind of thing, go. How can it be comfortable? You know it is, but you know it, it's that's the style of bike I like, and that's what I feel most comfortable on. That's why I build that. If I didn't like riding it, I would say, okay, maybe I got to add suspension or I got to do something. But um, you know, it, it's it's got to perform. I mean, it really has to perform. There's enough area of the bike that you can pull the art out of the object without having to. Re revert to some cartoon of a bike, which is what we got now. You know, they got a 360 tire now. Like, what the f, f is that? You know, it's like, you know, and these long front ends. It's like, I, I don't get it, honestly. I was there from the inception of it. I know how it got started, but it just kept getting more and more bastardized, and people are still sticking with that. You know, the extension of the front end started. We wanted a little bit more ground clearance, you know, because, you know, we raced these bikes in the dirt like, you know, we would ride to where we got, and then we'd race around, and you feel a little too low, you'd start bottoming out in the ruts, because we'd race in farm fields and stuff, and where we'd go up to the shale pits and stuff like that. So you need a little more clearance, and cornering too. The higher up it was, you had, the tighter you could corner. So you could utilize all of your tire, you know, when you laid it over. But then they go like, hey, two inches, what about four inches? What about a foot? You know, and then before you know it, it was like 28 inches over, and then, of course, it was up so high you had to rake it out, and now the front end's flopping, and it was a continued de-evolution of the machine. Who, um, right now, if you had to pick a couple other builders, you like your stuff, I know, but if there's other builders out there that, you know, I, I like that stuff, but I like their bikes. Who, Hank, who Hank, Hank Young, Hank Young. I like some, I like Chica's stuff, not for the style of the bike, but for the detail that he puts into it. Uh, you know, but Hank, Hank Young is really close there, and uh, I mean, I like Billy's stuff. He builds more of a, a different kind of chopper than I do, but it's still, um, he's got a bunch of crazy, wacky ideas that makes them work. 
but if I, if I was to buy a bike, it would probably be like from Hank Young or something. If I was going to buy a bike. Okay. There's a lot of good builders out there. It's, it escapes me right now who's, um, again, I'm more interested in like, you know, some of the like top fuel guys or, or the, the road race guys, because that's where the real precision and mechanics come in. Yeah. And that's where I'm really, the engines are really big to me. Well, I use a lot of that stuff. A lot of the racing technology I put in the engines, you know, it's, uh, most of the stuff is like earlier top fuel technology because the current stuff is not applicable to the street. So I use obsolete like top fuel technology in the engines now, just so they don't come apart. So I used to blow the cylinders off the engines and, you know, stuff uh, like that. Your bikes are fun to ride. Oh yeah, they're big fun. Yeah, they're big fun. Yep. That's important. Um, do you ever see yourself going fuel injection? Um, if I do, it'll be a mechanical fuel injection. It won't be uh, electronic or computers. I'm, you know, that's a new thing. I'm more, I'm all about the mechanics of it. I'm more of, a, of like a, a steam locomotive guy or a radial aircraft engine, pistons and push, you know, the, the mechanicalness of the universe, not some like hidden technology. I like to see what's going on. Uh, it's, you know, so what? You got a chip like this that controls everything. What is that? You know, it's like, it doesn't make any sense to me. You know, there's nothing, nothing to see or to view. You know, and the chopper's all about a visual experience. So the, I, I would go to like a mechanic, like a Hillborn injector or something like that, where you can see the pump and all the lines and all the mechanicalness of it. Um, would you classify yourself as old school? Well, that, that's like a term that's thrown around a lot um, anymore. And I guess people would say I'm like a, a, an old school guy, but. I, I'm not even sure what the hell that means. I mean, it's like, what is, I, you know, I'm not even sure what that means. It's, it's, you know, old school chopper builder. Well, old school chopper builder was a, a long front end springer that pogoed around and, you know, had maybe, uh, you know, a cobweb paint job on it. No, I'm not old school like that. I'm my own school, maybe. That's, you know, I just, you know, I, I don't think I can be really, they, they say I'm an old school builder, but I don't think I can really be pigeonholed. Uh, Mondo, who's the next, I'm going up against him in the next biker build off. I would consider him more of an old school guy than I am because he uses the long front ends and, you know, the skinnier tire and uh, long bikes. And I think maybe people consider him more old school. But then you go further back and you got the bobber. So is that old school? They ask me all the time, like, I, I don't know what the hell that is. You know, maybe you need a, a history professor to, Figure it out, you know. That was a great answer, though. I like it. Just my school, I don't know. My school. Yeah. Indian Larry School. Yeah, exactly. Um, Real school. Real school. <laughs> um, if I said, it's kind of like a, a psych test here. If I say Indian Larry, what would be the next word out of your mouth? If I say Indian Larry, is there one word that... Girls? <laughs> is that it? <laughs> My wife will love that one. She goes, you got to blurt out everything. I <laughs> I'd like to request that we keep the mic on you if it doesn't interfere with your work. doesn't bother me. Okay. And I hear me cursing at the guys that's or something. All right. we'll bleep it out. <laughs> I'm going to get her to hook you guys up with some shirts and stuff. Oh, cool. Or whatever, you know. I'll be right back. Did you analyze this, Russell? Yeah. What's the picture of the thing look like? Hold on. All right. Uh, let's see if license out to this thing. A mini chopper. Forty-nine cc. formulate some kind of thing and uh, think about it, all right? What's up, John?
What are you doing, Robert? Okay. Um, we tried to make um, um, hydraulic line. Where are they just screwing around? They're just screwing around? They're dropping here for a while? Yeah, Russ can flew back, the truck's gonna stay overnight, and then it's gonna follow us back to the spot. Oh, they come, what, they're coming back to get it? Yes. Who's, who's taking it down? They are. Yeah, he's got his truck. Oh, I see, he's gonna fall. Oh, okay, I got Russ it. Russ already back down in Florida. So we gotta load the rest of them into their form or the driver? Yeah, his, his driver's still in town. Oh, I got you, I got you, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, I just wasn't sure what their plan was. Try and keep up. <laughs> okay. I'm basically doing nothing, if you must know. <laughs> Some of your uh, micrometers? No, these are just uh, French curves and approach lengths. Easy stuff, easy stuff. There's a vernier. Right. Too many tools, too many tools. Transferring all my funds out, huh? Yeah, I'm gonna have to. <laughs> How are we doing? <laughs> I don't know. It's like you're supposed to tell me. I will. How are we doing? Are we sinking yet or what? No. No? no. Not yet? It means I gotta work harder at it? Yes. <laughs> you work harder at sinking the company? I won't let you do that. Russell? Do you, want to, do you want me to say this and look at it another time or just chuck it? I don't know if we want to get involved well, the only with thing this is, uh, It sounds like a cool idea, but then you're putting your name and we don't know how it's assembled or that's what I mean. how well it's built. If some kid gets, you know, yeah, that's... if the welding splits or something while the kid's riding it, we have no control over the uh, quality control. Yeah, and I'm making really. $400 just with me lending the name to it, you know, per, per unit. But you're also taking the chance that... No, I mean, they are. That's yeah. not what I'm going to do. 
I mean, it's, yeah, it's raked and shit. What if? Yeah, I think I'm gonna skip it. All so, right. Yeah. Don't need the aggravation. All right. I'm doing nothing impressive today, guys. There's nothing. Just being here. Impressive. Just being here. I could take a nap. Well, I got so much going on, horse. I can't even, you know, because the next the next thing is to do the Indian thing from that Kiwi guy. He wants to give me the whole power plant to build a, you know, a thing. But the next thing on deck is I got to finish that the discovery thing. I got to do the SNS bike, and I got to get the last two of those customers out of my hair. And then I can go on to projects. Uh, no, I'm, I'm done. I mean, wait, no, no, because I, no, no, I'm, I'm fine on that. Because I got the heads for the Discovery bike. I got the heads for the uh, Wild Child bike. I got the Easy Rider heads. And then uh, the SNS is giving me a whole engine. So we're, we're good on all that. Not, not yet, I don't need it. No, no, we're, 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 we're good to go on that. Seven fifty, maybe for bear. Something like that. I think I'd have to go back in the records and see what it is. I don't know. Yeah. Well, even if it's, even if it's the same price, I don't care. I'll get them from you if it's the same price, you know? I think it was 750, but let me go back in the records before we do the next set and see. But it would have to be some type of flat top. A flat top though, right? What would it be? Like a 30 degree angle? Yeah. Right, right. Well, let me let me get through these builds I got and then we'll regroup and see what the next project's going to be cuz my head is spinning. It is. It's spinning. I I don't know. right now, right this minute actually. So, it's, you know, I just got back from Laconia and I'm going to leave for the smoke out. So it's a film in between and trying to get some crap done. So it's, my head's spinning. It hurts. It hurts. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye-bye. Dino. Medium strength. Maximum strength. Grade 100. I forget what the hell we got last time. Steel chain, that's 70 grade, no, 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 30 grade, no. Oh, I know why it's not marked, because I, I uh, this is the new catalog, that's why. Uh, I think I got your old one. You got the old one? Oh, yeah. let me see, because I put them, oh, wait, wait, here it is, Kino, I got it. Five sixteenths and three eighths, what did we use? What are we 
okay, we're doing a frame out of this, right? I think it's three eighths, right? Who knows? What's the next size up? Well, you got three eighths. This must be three eighths because it's reading four hundred. This is three quarter. Oh, that's too big. <laughs> that's gonna be five. That's too big. This one. What do we say? We're gonna use this. That's too big too. Yeah, We're gonna I use this. this yeah, this is the right size. The calling is three seventy five, but it, I mean the calling is three eighths, but it's four hundred. So it's not five. It's three eighths size. This is going to be a frame for my new Discovery Project bike. So I hope that doesn't air to the Discovery build. <laughs> no building the whole, the whole uh, bike is going to be a chain frame, and then the front member of this is going to be chain also. The front legs of this, I've never seen this done in all this. I mean, I've seen a single chain down here, like that piece over there that he just had. But I've never seen the entire frame built out of chain, so that's what we're going to do on this one. Structurally, is that possible to hold that? Who knows? There, see? I think it's high strength chain. I mean, it's a high yield chain. And the welds hold on other parts of metal, so you got welds in metal. It's. I think it's possible, and what the hell? I mean, if it doesn't hold, then you die. So it's, it's then there's no big deal. It's, no, I'm pretty sure it's, uh, you know, we'll try it. What's the worst that could happen? That's the fun part. I think so. I mean, what the hell? All the rest of my engineering is guesswork, so what's the difference? <laughs> cut is that big. You see where the hole is? A little wire size? It's done with an electron discharge mach machine. It just displaces the, like removes the electrons between the pieces. It's pretty wild, right? You do like a puzzle like this, except it's uh, too expensive. <laughs> but it's just kind of a uh, and that's, you know what's cool too? That's as machine. This is, this is the other amazing part. That comes out like that as machine. You can feel that. It's just absolutely perfect. That's wow. as machine finish. You don't normally have to grind all this stuff, and that's it. It's done. Show me that edge again, Mike. Uh-oh. It's almost it's like perfectly smooth. You know, electron discharge machining. How many feet, Kino? Should be more than enough. 16 feet, yeah. What do you think? We'll get some smaller chain to do the diagonal. What do you think? The diagonal bracing? You know what I mean on this side? 
You know how you got it on the grease monkey, the diagonal going down? Right. We'll hang the oil filter down off that. We'll get a smaller chain, the sure. 5 16 sure. Get a couple of feet of 5 16 we can screw around with it. Yeah. Yeah. What else we need today, McMasters? Not that I know. Nothing? Nothing. Huh? He has nothing to do. Yeah. I'll find something for him to do.
Mate. John. Hey, John. I want to get this all glass beaded out so I can start brazing this in here. Okay, cool. Get it all. I'm going to leave this. I don't know what I'm going to do up here yet. I got to. Okay, but just mostly get that out of here. I want to get this ready to go to the chrome shop. Cool. Okay? Yep. this one.
No, I want mine. Where is it? All right, let's find these tools. This is, this is bullshit. Let's find the tools. It's supposed to be in here. Where is it? It's brand new. Brand new. It was here when I left to go to, to Michigan. Why is it out here now? John, you can take this and block it up like this so it's you know so it's flat. Yeah, drill one hole to there and then turn it over and drill the other one. Drill them separate. Yeah, drill them quarter inch. Okay. Just a quarter inch. Let me see how big they are when they come out. We'll see how that works out. All right. Design the transition here. Now you can take that. Okay. Some parts are SNS, some parts are STD. Uh, just I handpick each component for the application. And then, like the cylinders, they're, they're handmade. The cylinders are just start out as an 80 pound chunk. And then, yeah, they start out like that. And I get them, various people make them for me, various companies. Yeah. I design them what I want, and then uh, they're made to my specs. And we just finish them when we get them. It's very cool. I, I, didn't I didn't know that. Yeah. They just start out as That's big, 80 pounds a piece they start out, and they just get turned from that. Okay. Did we get that? Yeah. Larry, that, I mean, when some guys say they build their engines, I mean, you actually build these engines. I mean, each start from scratch. Yeah. Yeah, it's each individual piece. Well, like, you know, for instance, this piece here, this cam cover, 
The back of this one here is an SNS cover. This front piece here is a Morris, but these or pieces originally, this was one piece. So I took two different manufacturer's covers, split them in half, and I made a mandrel to locate this, and I rotated this forward because I needed a magneto in between the carburetors. So there is no piece like this that exists, so I had to make it. And I just made it out of different people's components. And then the cylinders start out, they start out as big 80 pound chunks of iron. They get handmade. But each, each, every piece of this engine I've assembled, every bearing, every clip, every stud, every gasket, seal, every single component has been designed or modified to fit. And what's what amazing feel. to me is, you know, you didn't come out of a technical institute, you self-taught yourself. Yeah, I'm definitely a self-taught motor builder, I didn't really, I just started doing it and, uh, I mean, I poured in my first set of heads probably when I was 14, 15 years old just and through blunders you know just kind of hey this works this doesn't work why is the engine going slower now than before i ported it you know it's like kind of they go that's too much you know you figure it out as you go so cool nothing to it but to do it you know <laughs> look at that <laughs> made for tv yeah, so they're back there, back there. Dude, everything's handmade. My logo up there. Yeah, we got Eat that. Or we'll just... cool. yeah. This stuff will be engraved more before I'm done, you know, so it'll be all covered. Probably on this one. I... Come on around back this way, Greg. There you go. Ignore the camera if you want right. to fiddle with the bike. That's fine. That's cool. Lean on it. Mm -hmm. um, Let me get some bubbles. Okay. If you can just say your name. Uh, my name is Kano Sasaki. Spell it for us, so if I'm not around. K E I N O. That's my uh, first name, and Sasaki is the last name. S A S A K S A S A K I. Okay. Yeah. Um, how long have you worked with Indian Larry? It's been four years. Yeah. It's been fifth years, I think. Okay. Where'd you get your uh, training or your experience before that? Um, I've been working on motorcycle and car stuff like that since I was a teenager. Then I went to the MMI, the, the mechanical school in Arizona. That was in 97, 98, something like that. That's the whole reason that I came to the state side. Uh, then, and um, how did you find Indian Larry? How did you convince to get into his shop? Well, it just I was looking for this job in the custom shop, and I just walked in the custom sh bike shop in Manhattan. Larry just happened to be there, so chance that's, of fate. Yeah, that's you know that that's all started there, you know. What's it like? What to work with him? Yeah, work with him. Tell the what? truth now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's great and it sucks at the same time, you know. It's. It's great working with him, but it sucks sometimes. You know, because he gets something gr grumpy, but you know, you gotta deal with it. Deadline it, must be killer. Oh man, it's it's not even funny. <laughs> what yeah. what do you do mainly with the bike? What's your forte? Um, I do pretty much everything besides motor work. Larry built the motor, mm -hmm. and uh, Larry sometimes build transmission. But I do like fabrication work and uh, the finishing detail, wiring, plumbing, all kinds of stuff. He makes up for my laziness. <laughs> <laughs> well, he gives me a basic direction that he wants to go on this bike, and I just, you know, I know what he likes. I know what would do, 
So I just, you know, go on that. Uh, good, UPS. Does he listen to your ideas? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes he doesn't. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite part? You had to, could you boil it down? What's your favorite part about working on the bike? Uh, just, it, that'll be pro probably the moment that it start the motor. You know, first you hear the sound, first you see the mechanical thing works, you know. Yes, I guess. So, um, where are you originally from? I'm from Japan. What, what, what convinced you to work on motorcycles and become stateside? Um, it was, it was just silly, it was just a, like a little bet in the uh, college cafeteria that, uh, you know, if I just, me and buddy were talking and, you know what, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to the state side, you know, and I, I kind of have to stick with it, kind of pre peer pressure back then. So, something like that. You're on? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. now you can send snapshots back to your buddies. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Um, if I'm, I did this to Indian Larry this morning, but if I say Indian Larry, what would you, what would your one word or one response be back if I say Indian Larry to you? Crazy. Crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Been super ch Is that a synonym for crazy? You said the truth. Huh? You well, said tell me truth. the truth. Yeah, it's the truth. <laughs> uh, hey, it works for me, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now we can turn the camera around and get the real truth from India. <laughs> tell us about Kano. Indian Enzo. Indian Lara. There's what, who makes it happen right there, the UPS man. <laughs> get the UPS. No. The famous no. UPS man. Enzo, what's up, guys? <laughs> All right, get him to the movie again. What do you got? Yeah, I got some stuff. Stainless steel. The hog pen. That's for Paul. So good thing I shaved this morning. Yeah. I better have performance machine on here, Enzo, or you go home with nothing. Where's my next day? There's no <laughs> next day. Why not? Because probably they never shipped it. Or we store up. Hi. Russell should be back in a minute. You want me okay. to give you checks, or he can do uh, it later? I see you busy. Come later? Yeah, I'm very busy. Can't let you distract me no more. <laughs> All right. What's this? Checks. Oh, oh yeah, checks for this, yeah. And then uh, pack this one out first, Russell. That one from Tech. I want to see if that's the battery for that bike on there. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Not easy designing these parts when you don't know what the hell you're doing or where you're going. I <laughs> just trying to pull it out of thin air. How the hell am I going to do this? <laughs> One and five eighths. All good. Yeah. Okay, and we'll get this made. All right, then I'll call that in. Okay. This one, this one's not. Fuck. Yeah, it's yeah, more like a true red. Yeah. I think when we start tossing the black in the others, it's like it's Yeah, let's go look over here. 
had some. What? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. Some kind of, I don't know what he plays, but something. Is that what he said? Yeah. One bike after the next looks exactly the same. This is just a layout that's kind of styled in the, in the uh, Sheridan Western tooling style, and I'll use it to, um, uh, you know, lay out patterns that complement shapes that I'm working on and that type of thing. And I really like this pattern a lot with the scroll work and everything. It's pretty intricate. Yes, yeah. So I'm just touching up a few details, kind of going back into the work and just uh, sharpening up a few details. Now, is that all that you put on there? to soften the leather as you're working it? No, I have to wet the areas that I'm working on. 
because initially I'll wet the whole, I'll wet the whole uh, leather and transfer my image from my drawing. And then uh, as I'm working and it starts to dry a little bit, I'll just spot wet the area that I'm still working on. Okay. Now, is this something that was self, self taught Paul? Or did you, I mean, how did yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, everything's out there in books someplace, or, you know, you do it enough and figure out what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. And, um, you know, eventually you get someplace. But if I ever got stuck for any information, Every, you know, everything is accessible someplace. I don't really bother tracking people down or, or asking people. It's kind of like the easy way out, it seems to me sometimes. Mm -hmm. I, I really like figuring it out for myself. That surface that you're working on there, Paul, is that... Um, the granite? Granite. Is that how it used to be done? I mean, is, is that a table that you made to do this on? Yeah, I made this for this. It's got two-inch granite inlaid into the surface because there's no, you, you can't replace the feel of either granite or marble for tooling. The, the rebound, the, the warmness of it, you know, it's just the perfect surface for tooling is ideally uh, marble or granite. Um, nothing else really responds quite like it. So this is the only surface that I can do the tooling on. I don't really use too many tools. I like to use a couple of little detail items every now and then but really just you know the chisel the swivel knife and a couple of beveling tools and um, and really since I do everything freehand you can get a lot out of just a handful of simple tools because there's there's hundreds of little specialty tools available but um, it's it's just it's just too much I mean if you're doing it freehand you can get a lot out of just a couple of simple things and a few patterns and a few uh, you know shaping tools How long have you been doing? Um, I was trying to think. I probably made my first uh, project, you know, sometime when I was like 14 or 15, and then pretty much kept it up from there. Um, you know, doing like belts and, and little side projects and making like hockey gear and, you know, uh, Mad Max looking spiky stuff and all that kind of thing. <laughs> You know. I'm just going to kind of run a little bit and tell you got what you need. Okay. All right. Uh, I, like the, I like the Paul Cox leather sign up there, too. Oh, some Paul kids Ray. in a school in uh, Wisconsin, I think, made that for me. I should actually look look that up before I say. I can't remember where they went. But some kids at Kennedy High School, I should say, made that sign for me. Oh, okay. Very nice. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got to the point where the tooling is dry and I can dye it. I use this uh, oil-based oil -based dye and a sheep's wool to spread it on. Sheep's wool works really great because it holds a lot of dye and you can carry it over to the work without it really dripping. Spreads real nice. Yeah. 
My coat you put on. Uh, two, three coats soaks in pretty good because this carries a lot of dye and you can really, you know, lay it on and give it a chance to, to soak in. Because through the tooling it starts actually coming through the back side and you can tell that it's really fully, you know, penetrating the skin. Just kick Paul out of the scene, that's all. Keep him out of my segment. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. As long as you don't run away with my 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 glory, Paul, you're okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. You've always got center stage, Larry. Don't worry about it. Oh, is that what it is? I'm trying to hide yeah. anymore. Let me get this one. Um, I've known Larry for about probably 15 years, something like that, 12, 15 years. Um, you know, from the bike scene around the East Village, downtown, and um, always loved what he did. And then, you know, he came upon me doing what I, what I was doing in the, in the leather work, and, and we just, um, just kind of clicked right from the beginning. And, uh, and he was working out of a shop downtown and really, uh, you know, wanted to work on projects with me and I wanted to work on stuff with him and we kind of hooked up like that. And I was always doing my thing while he was doing his, but you know, we tended to kind of be in shops together over the years, except for just a, a couple of years a while back. But for the most part, you know, we've been in shops together, doing our own thing sort of side by side. It's good. Yeah. You know, we bounce ideas around, you know, and yeah, it's cool. It's never boring, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Oh, my bike, the Berserker? The Berserker, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's not here right now, but... Uh, I saw it down in San Antonio, I think. Were you down in San Antonio? Yeah, 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 I had it down there. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I love that bike. It's a lot of fun to ride. Really, it's the blast. There's not any metal showing, really. Right. It's covered in leather. Right, right. Um... Yeah, it's all steel underneath, but it's just covered in leather, and it's like a skin that I can remove. It's either bolted on or strapped on or, or uh, buckled on or whatever, and I can take it all off. But I mean, it just stays on and just lives its life. Yeah. You know, yeah. it gets it gets you know rainstorms or weather or road grime or whatever it just makes it richer and deeper. It's just like all the brass and the copper that I use and that Kano likes and Larry likes. You know, they all have their own personality. All these different elements. Same as the leather. You know, it could be like steel or like wood. That's why I like working with it. It's got a lot of range. You guys are sculptors. You're, you're, you're artists. I mean, you're just working mm -hmm. at a different medium. Yeah, I mean, especially from his viewpoint, just looking at it as sculpture is what a lot of people do, and that's that's great in its in its own, you know, in its own world. But there's an important element to these that we like here is the uh, the the practicality and the rideability and all that kind of thing of the machines that come out of here, you know, because just art for its, for art for art's sake, you know, is basically non-functional. It's just kind of, yeah. and, uh, I, I put it as art and performance, like a type of performance art. Well, I, I'd be hesitant to say that because I'm not a big fan of performance. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's, but the sculptural aspect is definitely there. I mean, and it's, and it's all from the heart, like, Art is, you know what I mean, yeah, and it's I'd, just. I'd, I'd be hesitant to call it craftsmanship because I think it's more than just craftsmanship. I think it is a step beyond too, because I mean, you can learn a craft and art is sort of a part of who you are going in, yeah. and then you tend to refine the techniques and the way to, to represent it and the way to kind of, let it out, in your craft, but it's something that I think is either a part of somebody or not, depending on how you, how you yeah. show it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, they got to be fun to ride, and they got to do their job. They can't just sit in the corner or, or up front looking pretty. Yeah. I say Indian Larry, and you come back with a word or a phrase. So if I say Indian Larry, what's mm -hmm. the first thing that pops into your mind? Edge. Edge. He's always about an edge, good or bad. It's that's it. Yeah, yeah.
I got this out, I'm just going to hit this with some dye too. Yep. Just kind of continue on.
Oh, oh, middle of the roof. That's kind of funny. This is about like a it's about Indian Larry. Oh yeah? I didn't even know he was famous.
Marianne. It's come to this. Ten years with the Hubble Yeah? Me? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. See? Yeah? Where do you hear my new schemes? He's I laughing. Want, I want you to come, wait till you come get off the throne and go to the other side there, right to the gate for me. Okay. He's laughing. <laughs>
after we finish at Sturgis, I'll give it to them. Uh, and I'll keep it for approximately a year on tour, and then I'll get it back. And, uh, but at this point, I'll, if somebody wants to buy it. I mean, did somebody ask you to do, did, like, give you some design specifications? No, I designed the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Design, yeah. Nope. Man, yeah, just, you know, my wife collects a bunch of tiki stuff, and I just have a little tiki bike. I just, I just wanted to try this out, you know, the bamboo. I, like, I had this idea for a while. Um, Larry, what's, if there is in your mind, is there a difference between East Coast, West Coast, proper difficulty? Uh, I think the bikes like I build are more East Coast oriented, at least Northeast. That I think you'll find this style of bikes more uh, in the New England states, just because of the roads for one thing, because um, like the long bikes like Billy has and stuff, these roads here would just those bikes would be broken in a matter of days. You know, we, we would break those bikes up here. We need like more incline, you know, less rake to absorb like the potholes. Yeah. You know, we need a decent front end short. And we need them, at least in New York City, we need them very nimble because of the traffic. Because you're always getting cut off. I mean, you, you leave your house knowing somebody's going to do something stupid. So um, those bikes are not maneuverable. I mean, no matter what the builders say, that's just the facts of life. So they can't maneuver like this. and. Anybody that wants, we'll put a thousand dollar bet down. We'll go once around Manhattan. We'll see what's up. So <laughs> let's prove it. Yeah. So we need we need maneuverable bikes that can absorb some of the potholes around here. So I think that's the difference, maybe yeah. east to west, and even uh, northeast to southeast. The roads are a lot smoother down there. And, but I would still build the same style of bike. I just like a bike that's real responsive, right. not sluggish. You know, you got tractor trailer trucks, and then you have sport. Change the laws of physics. The wheelbase is the wheelbase. Longer it gets, less maneuverable it is. I mean, that's just the facts of life. It could be leaking, yeah, sometimes it happens. Hey, Larry, can yeah. you sit there for just one more second and talk? Okay. What's going on? What are we talking about? <laughs> I don't know, like shitty mall building. <laughs> <laughs> you damaged it going in the frame, that's what happened. Yeah, right. Look at this patch. Look at this fucking cast. Yeah, it's beefed up. It's all yeah. House of Horsepower Cal Products case. Yeah. Yeah. It's obsolete, right? Scraps. You know what, this probably should be a bit longer, but let it go. That's yeah, right. that's right. Yeah. Uh, it's made up, I was going to say it was on a barb, you could change it, but that's okay. Okay, it's fine. Yeah. And tomorrow if this comes, it'll be all right. You got a little oil in there, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right, good.
me to do electro over here because they're trying to hook me up with a jet engine from the Port Authority. We're going to build a, a jet something. <laughs> After the summer. After the summer. Lucky you. I, I gotta I, go to I'll interrupt one second. That's all right. Give me a look right here, Larry. Larry, might seem a little, um, can you just bring your left hand a little more? There you go. Everybody help Steve out? 